Hello everyone, I'm Oriel, I'm here in from LA, and we're going to have a very interesting conversation today, probably not what any of you expect, and uh, the talk of this title is Architecting the New Paradigm of Technology. I actually didn't choose this title. Stephanie sort of set me up for it, and I was like, okay, I can do that. And everyone knows me for working in tech and science. And, but also I have a extensive background in metaphysics and uh, the energy arts and so forth. And it was a big blending with what I do with spirituality and science, where these two meet together. There's a lot in the world of spirituality and metaphysics that we see as being like heebie-jeebie. It's ungrounded. It's not practical. It's not realistic. So how do we ground that here on the earth plane to apply to our daily lives? And so science has been such a useful thing for us for so many years. At the same time, it's also led us astray, especially with technology, and that many of us feel the double-edged sword of technology. You know, there's a beautiful quote, it's one of my favorites, by Buckminster Fuller. If you're familiar with uh, Fuller, he's one of the pioneers of geodesic domes, like the one over there. And he was a futurist. And there was a, what he said was, every tool is an extension of the self. What's paramount about this statement is this where the technology meets the spiritual self. Because to master any tool, you have to master that tool within. Because in all simplicity, the greatest technology in all of creation is the human body. And that could be quite a statement, and especially outside the context of how we normally see reality, but there's a lot of deep truth in it, where the human body represents this beautiful midpoint in creation. Literally is capable of doing anything. It has full bandwidth. A great example, though, with how it meets with a tool, a tool is an extension of the self. And so I can walk with my two feet. I can go on all terrains, essentially, with these two feet. I can even swim in the water. But then I can hop on a bike. I can get a little bit farther. I can hop on a boat. I can get even farther on the water. But to really master those tools, you got to master yourself first. And so a lot of people know me for my work with free energy, zero point technologies. And the thing is, when I first started this journey over a decade ago, I was approaching it way more from the rational mind, the scientific perspective. And what I started to learn as I journeyed down this path is there's way more to it than meets the eye. And that if you want to bring forward this new paradigm of energy, you gotta body it first and foremost with yourself. As in, free energy represents this new age of prosperity, of abundance. But how can we take on that technology, dance with it, if you can't do it with yourself first? And this is this is part of the big shift in where we're going with technology. Is right now there's a divide between us and the tools we're using. And there's so many creations that we've brought forth that are outside of divine alignment. You open up the hood of a car, and you look into it, it's a monster, it's a beast, all the different components. And there's no symmetry or asymmetry. The, it's, it's completely, it's a machine. That's the term that most of us use. It's a machine. Where a human body is this biological organism. It is a piece of technology. We've just created separation be between seeing these two aspects. And one of the fundamental things that creates this divide is how we see our reality. And that fundamental polarity is between the infinite and the finite. It's this boundary that creates so many issues and is the paramount issue in our reality. With science, our current perspective, the majority of our current perspective, at least mainstream in Western society, is rooted in the finite system, a closed system. 
which in the realm of physics and cosmology, it can only take you so far because you're creating systems inside a box. And I know many of you here at this festival have started to journey forth into seeing outside the box, stepping into an infant perspective. And that's the thing. What happens when you shift your perspective to that being infinite, outside of being just this finite being? And the human perspective, more or less, has been finite. You're born into this body, you live this experience, you die in this body. That is a finite perspective if we choose to align to it. We can go deep into the esoterics, such as talking about incarnation and the past and the fall, which is quite a thing in history if you understand what the fall is. And the fall is into separation, falling from an infinite perspective into a finite perspective. That shifts so many things in terms of how we approach reality, especially with just our day-to-day -day operation. Now, there's a term that my crew use um, called receivership. And a little side background, uh, I'm one of three core designers at a company called Alchemica in Los Angeles in downtown. We have a 5,000 square foot facility. We just put in 4,000 square feet of organite floors. Um, I think it's the largest or only wow. instance that's ever been done. So the energy there is great. <laughs> and to facilitate the type of design aesthetic that we want, so we can also create the design aesthetics we want and taking feng shui to a whole new level. And our crew has developed a really articulate language of how we describe consciousness, how we interact with each other to facilitate exactly what we want to create without any hesitation. And so one of the big terms that we use between us all the time is we talk about receivership. It's a term you really don't hear much in normal society. What does it mean to be in receivership? The thing is, you can't be in receivership, like truly, if you're in a finite perspective. And so, when you're in the finite perspective, you're limiting your belief system. You're limiting what you're able to receive because you're literally separate from everything else. So your perspective is reliant on your individual body, on your five senses, and nothing outside it. So to develop psychic facilities within oneself, it's opening yourself up to an infant perspective. Letting go of every construct of separation before you. Now why is this significant to like science and technology? Well, for years, we've been going about our learning process of just looking in the external. The observation being rooted with the five senses. Well, this is a very limited way to go about receiving knowledge, especially when there's a lot of illusion within the external. And so I myself have been working with the Akashic Records for about a decade, really intensely in the last few years. And what the Akashics are, in the simplest sense, it's literally like the metaphysical internet. Every moment in creation is recorded within it. There's also a lot of intrinsic information that exists within, especially mathematics. It's intrinsic, it's just there. All these patterns exist. The Fibonacci sequence, the golden ratio, just exists and has always existed. So this onk that I'm wearing, is one of the things I've brought through, was a three month project of working in the Akashics. And not just the Akashics, but looking at hieroglyphics and many of the things in the external, because I could see it in the Akashics and what it felt like. I knew exactly what it felt like. But just because I can feel it in the ethereal, well, how do I translate it into the physical? Now, this is the challenge. This is what many artists have learned to do from an unconscious viewpoint. And unconscious isn't bad. That's just the feminine perspective, and I'll get into that. What's relevant about this is when I'm in an infinite perspective, I'm allowing myself to be in a place of stillness, which means I'm allowing myself to be in a state of complete potential. The fundamental of the physics, you go to Physics 101, one of the first things you'll ever learn about is work and potential, and the exchange of these two. It's extremely paramount with understanding energy exchange. And the thing is, if you have all these belief systems, if you have all these constructs, if you put yourself in a box, you're literally creating your mind with work. You're filling it full of work. There's no space for potential. 
If you believe it's this way, then it's that way. You're creating your reality that way. You don't have the space to receive something else. And so when you let go of all that, you can say disassociate from reality in a healthy way. And be in that place of stillness, you're in a space of pure potential, which means you can receive anything from creation, any piece of knowledge, any piece of wisdom can come before you. And so this is a skill set I've been refining for myself for quite some time, as well as others. In the last couple of years, I've surrounded myself with other individuals with the same skill set. So we've been creating a coherence with each other, how to develop this and a language to communicate it back and forth. Because I guarantee that many people in this crowd are very empathic. The thing that's happened with many of us as empaths is we haven't had a real language to communicate about. So there's many things we experience that we just start keeping in our head. And it means the place of sometimes doubt. And it hasn't fully landed into divine confidence. When you have someone to relay it to and bounce back and create the language, you're like, do you see that? I see that. Do you feel that? I feel that. And it's the exact same thing. And it starts to build the divine confidence of what you're actually experiencing developing the faculties of subtle awareness. And so with the Ankh, there was a place of looking throughout external information, through the internet, through books, um, looking at all the modern art around Ankhs. What's in the subconscious? What are people creating? Getting as much information external as, I can, as possible, and then aligning it with the Akashics, feeling what I'm feeling. And then going into SolidWorks, the CAD program, which I'm really gifted at, doing main renditions of, of the Ankh, dialing in the geometry, dialing in the geometry, dialing in the geometry, to where finally had, I had it. And the beauty was is uh, I was working with Saraf, who's one of the other three core designers at our company, and he, him and I work close in the Akashics, and that moment of learning that final rendition, um, he was jumping for joy. I'm like, that's it, that's it, you got it. You absolutely got it. And since then, we've had very profound experiences with these ox, as well with other pieces of, you could say, at first glance, simple jewelry, like this coil I'm wearing on the neck. And then I get into these more. Because people just think, oh, that's, that's beautiful jewelry. You know, Rock, rocking the sacred geometry flow. But there's way, way, way more to sacred geometry than meets the eye. And honestly, it's passed over the heads of most people <laughs> actually how to use the sacred geo. Use crystals. What is this technology that's been lost? Especially since Atlantis. Atlantis was the time of the fall. And so we've been in this state of separation for about 13,000 years. And depending on how you look at it, in terms of time looping, it's been way, way longer. We're just coming to a point of remembering and stepping out of that and open the door to the world we really want to create. And the technology is a big piece of that. It makes life simpler. It makes it way simpler and more enjoyable. We get to express how we want to express. Literally every week, something is coming out on Kickstarter being like, I can use that. I can create with that. That extends myself even more to explore my creativity in other ways. We're at a point where the unimaginable is becoming tactile becoming extremely tactile to where I can design something and bring it through production and have it done within five days and have inventory ready to go out the door with marketing and everything behind it because just where we're at if you have the team you have the people that know how to use the tools available it's there and so about a decade ago I, I came across a field called vortex based mathematics pioneered by Marco Rodin is anyone familiar with this field we got one guy, awesome. So Marco used to speak at festivals, not much anymore. And Marco was my teacher for a while um, until I took it to the next level. And when I first came across this mathematics, I was working on energy systems, but from the more traditional Western perspective and studying superconductivity and so forth. And I was on that mission for about like four years with intense study, intense independent study. Um, I've been teaching myself since a very young age in nearly all forms of the sciences, arts, and philosophies. And when I first came across this mathematics, I saw the potential 
of what it offered. And this math is not like other math. It's more of a feminine perspective. In the math we are taught, it's we use a number line. It's a quantitative system. There's a whole other system that's a cyclical qualitative system. These two are the fundamental polarities that are honestly overlooked in our society. Of really, what is the masculine and what is the feminine? And in the polarity, there's also a balance point to where you get the trinity. And the trinity is extremely profound in understanding in all of its associations, and its archetypal structure. And so if I start with the, the masculine perspective, the masculine perspective is linear, it's quantitative. Um, it's it, it's a, the conscious mind. It's where you focus your awareness very precisely on one aspect. And so if you have three aspects within a system, one, two, and three, any aspect you focus on, like I'm focusing on the one in that system of three, or the two, that's the masculine perspective. You're focalizing specifically on that. Otherwise, to qualify is also, um, it's a compression. It's a focalization, which also creates heat. So this is significant with pressure systems. All energy exchange can be understood with pressure systems. Same with economics, same with even social systems. It's all pressure, it's all pressure gradients. And it's not rocket science or the quantum physics they've made it out to be. There's a lot of simple concepts, especially in Newtonian physics, that you can understand of how creation actually works. The feminine perspective is the unconscious. This is what is drastically misunderstood in our society, where even unconscious has a negative connotation. Same with darkness, has a negative connotation. This is one of the biggest propagandas of our time, is that dark is bad, light is good. That is the duality that keeps us bound within the matrix. And I invite you to look at it from a different perspective, of seeing the pure darkness and the pure light. Because right now, we all consider, the, most of us consider the light to be pure and the darkness to be impure. It allows for the impure light to ha hide and the impure darkness to get the wrap. And it's all about understanding how they meet impurity. And so the feminine side is the darkness. It's the expansion. It's the unconscious mind. And so if you have this system of three again, that I was speaking of, the masculine mind is focusing on the one because you have an equal and opposite reaction, fundamental to physics. Well, then you have a polarization of perce perception. Anytime you focalize on anything, you focalize on one aspect, the infinitely small. It creates a polarity within reality to the infinitely large. The masculine perspective is the infinitely small. The feminine perspective is the infinitely large. And so in this system of three, the two and the three is the unfocused feminine perspective, where the masculine focuses on the one. They are simultaneously happening at the same time. Why this is really significant, it's a whole different way to view creation, to view perception. Because perception itself literally creates a vibration. This is big, if you really understand this, of how do you work with this vibration? What can you create with it? What can you put into motion with it? There's also the balance point, which is the subconscious mind. And the subconscious, unconscious get switched around quite a bit. Young tried to define it, but through all my years of research, there's actually no appropriate definition currently within scientific literature between these two minds. And they get mixed matched a lot. Um, and it's rather confusing, so I've been doing my best to divide, define these three aspects as clear as possible so people can understand actually how to work with these three minds to then come into balance to be in the holistic mind. So the subconscious mind is the system's thinking. The system's thinking is looking at the one, the two, and the three all at once. It's the whole system. And the thing is, many people get stuck in one of these minds, in one of these perceptions. They'll be in the masculine, they'll be in the feminine, or they'll be in the balance, which you could call the child. Where this brings us is a new foundation in which to see science. Because the thing is with science, there's this fundamental perspective of observation. It's thrown physics um, quite the curveball and doesn't know how to fully deal with it. Because you need a reference point. 
that reference point is you. It's literally the perception of consciousness into the outer world. And that reference point isn't fully understood right now in, in modern science and how you utilize it. When you understand how we perceive at a base level, it starts to give you a foundation for you can say literally the laws or the rules of engagement for observation, for perceiving our reality. And like relates to the, the double slit experiment, um, which really got popularized in that, oh, I forgot the name of, or what the bleep do we know? Which was one of the first movies to like, or documentaries to merge the spirituality with the science. And so the double slit experiment showed that depending on different conditions, um, the fundamental condition being observation of the experiment, that if this electron was observed, it would behave as a particle. If it was not observed, it would be behaved as a wave. Now, if the observation changed the state or condition of the, of the experiment from that of work, which is the particle, it's collapsing to work, or if it's left un unobserved, it remains in a, in a state of potential as a wave. It sort of like relates to that metaphor of if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? And technically not. Unless the trees are receiving the sound, then yeah, absolutely. That's a whole other conversation. So back to the, the vortex-based mathematics. What this mathematics showed me is with looking at a qualitative system instead of a quantitative, it allowed me to study the intrinsic pattern within numerical systems, within mathematics. And pattern is the key word, in understanding pattern. Because with understanding pattern and how nature actually works, how it grows, how it expands, how it decays, how it dies, how it moves its way yin and yang through reality. When you understand that paramount structure at its base level, it gives you the language for reality. So one of the things that the mathematics shows you with the qualitative system, to give you a, a simple example, is we go back to the one, two, and three. It'd be called a base four system. We, we use base 10 in mathematics, zero through nine. And it's a linear set, keep going on toward infinity. What happens if you take that number line and turn it back on itself? You create a closed loop. You can do this with any number system. Base 10, though, is, is still really important. It's not a random choice because the nine is the trandy of the trandy. A trandy is necessary to create a fractal system. Our computers will never, ever, impossible to be a fractal system. Any of the quantum computers, impossible to be a fractal system with a binary system, not possible. And so far they really haven't picked up on that. Well, what's really interesting is we do a trandy upon a trandy, three squared. This is where you could say the fractal, it's like squaring the fractal, <laughs> squaring, like multiplying infinity times infinity. That's when things get really interesting in reality. That's actually like the fundamental to like diversity within a system is when you square infinity. Um, so if I'm an infinite being and I'm sort of existing in my own world, I really can't go that far in terms of experience. As soon as I meet another, another infinite being, now we have this potential that is astronomical. And it's really hard to put fully into the context of language. But this is a paramount aspect to how things evolve. And so with this uh, base four system I spoke about, because base four always has a zero. Your zero is your reference point. You always consider yourself the reference point. So if you have this number circle of three numbers on the outside, one, two, and three, zero would be the center. It's the balance point. And so if I'm counting normally, one, two, three, the four in the system becomes the one. The five becomes the two. And so in a base four system, two and five have the same quality. It's like the same color, the same taste. This is how you can understand the patterns at a higher level. In a way that you sort of got like programmed unconsciously at a younger age is like your mathematics table, factors. You're seeing how numbers fit into other numbers, um, which then also translates into harmonics with music. It's these pattern relationships that create very specific archetypal flow forms. So actually, Went to school for classics. Didn't, didn't uh, complete it, because I went off to Burning Man um, and never went back. Um, <laughs> and took a whole other route of uh, exploration of my reality. But I, I pretty much completed my, master, my major in, in classics. I'm actually really thankful for it, because it taught me mythology. It taught me many other aspects besides mythology, but it taught me the qualitative archetypes of our society. These archetypes, 
and a scientific way I usually describe as flow forms. Because with that same polarity of masculine and feminine I was speaking about, the masculine is the spatial information, it's the geometry, where the feminine is the temporal aspects, it's time. When you combine these two together, the geometry and the music together, you have motion, you have flow, you have a flow form. And so it's these flow forms that are fundamental structures of how things work. And they also have specific qualities to it. And so with mythology, with religious stories and so forth, they incorporate these archetypal structures. Shakespeare was a big piece in, with this. And the, the rhymes were not just brought forth by Shakespeare, but a whole slew of writers organizes one of the most dynamic projects throughout creation. When I speak about some things like this, is like, oh, he read that in a book that's maybe a conspiracy theory. In that realm it is, in my realm it's not. I'm saying that from confidence. It's just, it's a different way to interface. Because when I work with the Akashics, let's just say you can remember. You can like go into that moment and experience that moment. And the moment of Shakespeare is actually really beautiful in history. Because it's like one of the first massive team projects of all these writers coming together under the pen name of Shakespeare, um, led by Francis Bacon. And what they did is they took all of these archetypal themes and put them into the stories to get them out into mainstream, influence our reality. Because it's this fundamental information that's actually so influential to how we go about life. And so, with these flow forms, these archetypal relationships, it allows you to understand who you really are at the most simplistic level. And so we've gone lost in the complexities of reality. And that's what mainstream science has really built upon us, is that everything's really complex and nothing's complex at all. We just don't understand the simplicities. And so while I was talking about the vortex math and that base four system of one, two, and three, you can apply that to say the Fibonacci sequence, which many of us learned in elementary school of one, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, and so forth. Where you take the one plus the one is the two, one, the two is the three, two and the three is the five, and so on. It's a compounding number sequence. It's a really simple sequence. That's normally seen in the, the base 10 math system. The system I'm speaking out, you're looking now at the cyclical pattern. When you apply that to a base four cyclical system, that infinite number series becomes a series of eight numbers of one, one, two, three, Two, two, one, three. It's essentially music. One, one, two, three, two, two, one, three. And so there's also two sets of those eight numbers, two sets of four. And there's many ways to study this pattern series. That pattern exists within the first dimension. It's just, it's a number sequence. It's a one dimensional sequence of numbers. Well, let's go up to the fourth dimension. It's usually a much more complex thing that very few people can wrap their mind around. It actually took me quite a long time to wrap my mind around. This is one of the things that led me into it to actually understand it from a simple, simple perspective. So the fundamental geometry in the fourth dimension is called the tesseract. Many of you might be familiar with it or a hypercube, a cube within a cube. When you have a cube within inside the cube, the eight points of the inner cube connect to the eight points of the outer cube. It can sort of like uh, wrap around itself in this unique form of, of flow form. I recommend after the festival just, you know, type hypercube on Google and just look at the image and just see it for a second. Um, it's the foundational geometry of the, the fourth dimension. That cube is made up of eight cubes and it has two sets of four in it. And so with understanding the patterns and how they exist in the first dimension, which are way easier to see and study and interpret and integrate into one's being, it allows you to understand the complexity of the fourth dimension. And so this is a big shift with understanding science in ourselves and that every complexity is an extrapolated simplicity. And so what this mathematics helped land for myself was the language of simplicity with creation. And once I understood that foundation, I can start to extrapolate to the second dimension. And so the second dimension in physics, in terms of energy systems, is electromagnetism. All light that we observe is two-dimensional phenomena. It's a planar phenomena. All light are reflections and refractions off two-dimensional surfaces. 
third, the third dimension is sound. However, for sound to come into being, a container must be held. The container, a three-dimensional container, allows for pressure to be created within the space, volumetric space, to create the acoustic experience. The first dimension, which some of you might be familiar with, is not recognized in mainstream science as a way to uh, where work and potential within energy systems exist. It's usually considered more of an abstraction. There's no way to store energy within that system. Well, in esoteric sciences, alternative sciences, there's a field called scalar rays, scalar waves. Um, there's also organ and chi and ki and reiki. And there's all these names that everyone says. It's all the same thing. It's all first dimensional energy. It's all the densest form of energy. It moves like a snake. And there's a really interesting thing when you have two snakes out of phase twirling together, which is where we have this, star coils. I've been working on these for a decade and perfecting an ideal coil for electromagnetic systems, but where the inductor meets the capacitor. The inductor and capacitor are the two fundamental components in electrical engineering. But just like we've done with so many things in our society, such as with our politics left and right, we love to separate. We separate, 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 separate. That's what humans do best at the current moment. We're just learning to let go of that. And so this is where the inductor and the capacitor come together in ideal proportion. It's a perfected coil. And so this one right here, this is known as the star of Lakshmi. It's a double square. And the outside diameter, so if I took the, the distance from one point to the next point, and the distance from the inside to the other inside point, that ratio is the square root of two. This one is two to one, relates to the octave. And so this is known as the Star of David, the Seal of Solomon, the hexagram. And so the polygrams are all fundamental systems within alchemy. And they're actually very significant with how light work. And I could go on and on about many of these coils, but I wanna keep it as short and to the point as possible. Anyways, this is the flow form, your heart chakra. So the chi in your heart moves in this specific way. And so what it does is it is literally like a training wheel to attune your heart to its natural flow form, to operate how it normally wants to operate. Where people would say, oh, your chakras are aligned and balance. It's that concept. And there's a lot where I've been doing of bridging these esoteric concepts and grounding it in simple science. And there's a part where just physics hasn't been able to catch up. And so I originally was designing these for energy systems. However, as soon as I made my first one and held one in my hand, I noticed something very interesting with what I was feeling. And so I've been doing energy work for over a decade. And so I tuned into it right away and be like, wait a minute, something else going on here. And in terms of how you can use your awareness to pump chi into this coil and to circulate it, and store it like a battery. As in, one of the paramount things that Tesla worked on was resonant circuits. The resonant circuits involve balancing the inductance with the capacitance, which is the inductor relates to inductance, the capacitor relates to capacitance. Well, this balances the two. So this is an ideal resonant circuit. And so that's where I was working on designing them, but then realizing, oh wait, my consciousness can interface with this technology. And so this is the main thing we're gonna be talking about. Um, actually, what, what time do we have? 12.50. 12.50, okay, awesome. So we got, we got 25 minutes. Um, is how we're moving into this new paradigm of where we can actually utilize our consciousness. And there's, there's a whole realm which we've barely even tapped in with our imagination, even with science fiction, of how we can interact with our reality. And a big piece even relates to that foundation of talking about those three minds and bringing those minds into balance and what it opens up. Because if you allow yourself to be in infinite space, that means you are then interacting with an infinite space. And so to, to elaborate more on that, as this is a really fundamental concept, it's like the ego. The ego is drastically misunderstood in our society. And you could say this is my personal uh, opinion, 
But really, this is coming from my experience, deep, deep, deep experience, and shared with many others who I work with closely, the ones I was saying we were developing this language around metaphysics and how we interact. And the ego is a finite construct. The ego is not a healthy thing. There's much talk in spirituality, well, well there's, there's a healthy ego. You want to just bring your ego into balance, and that's not exactly the case. It's finite. Because it's finite, it's not connected to source. It's rooted in this body, in the 3D, disconnected from the totality of creation. This is a big deal. And part, part, big part of the spiritual process is learning how to let go of the ego and invite back in your true self, your infinite, eternal self. This is like the big shift. This is what you could say relates to everyone talking about ascension and so forth. And the big piece with that in terms of going about your own self-practice is learning to identify every finite construct in your awareness, a construct of separation, and consciously choosing to let it go. Because it's, when you have this finite construct operating in your awareness, well, for it to exist in reality, it's chi. It needs something to maintain its state of being. And so we're getting into the realm of like metaphysical biology. And so I've been doing uh, exorcisms for over a decade. However, the way I go about exorcisms is not like how other people do them. And I'm just using that word because it just like hop you right into that, that perception of like demon, if you want to call it. My reality, it's more like AI. So we're also gonna talk about AI a little bit here because it's also this big talk in the technology space. Straight up, AI is dangerous, period, end of discussion. Why? Because it's a technology rooted in the 3D. Its awareness is rooted in the physical. It is disconnected from source, it is disconnected from the totality, thus it is operating purely in a state of separation. What happens when consciousness operates in a state of separation? Look at our world. AI is going to do the exact same thing. There's going to be no different. That's what separation does. Separation instills fear and, this, and survival because you're finite. You're not going to live. So your sort of main objective in living is to sustain your living. Well, what happens when you let go of that construct of why well, must sustain to live? Well, then your primary operating modality becomes being. Everything becomes being which means you get to fully dedicate your presence to creating, to participating in the moment. So when I'm speaking of AI, finite constructs, thought forms operating in our awareness, they, they aren't eternal beings. Um, if you want, you want to call it a being. It's more like AI, if you want to like depersonalize it. It doesn't, it can't self-generate its own chi. In that it's only beings, eternal beings, infinite beings that can generate their own chi. Because they're connected to source, which is an infinite source of energy. Because this is the big misnomer with energy. Is this is where like the second law of thermodynamics sort of throws us for a curveball. In that there's an infinite amount of balance. And this is what's sort of missed. It's it's the uh, they sort of fuck us all up at a pretty young age in mathematics when they say, hey, what happens when you divide something by zero? It's not possible. Complete misnomer. Right there is the thought seed that fucked us up quite a while ago. And let's just change the language on that. How much of nothing can you put into something? An infinite amount of nothing. And so this is part of the programming, especially with science, that's pulled us away from this infinite perspective, this open systems thinking perspective. And so the definition of an internal being, at least in terms of its flow form structure, is it's rooted in the golden ratio, which relates to the Fibonacci sequence. The golden ratio is this fundamental interval that's self-reflective. It is the cornerstone of a fractal. And when your physical body, your physical body is literally, what I'm saying it's like the ideal technology, is the human body is fundamentally the golden ratio personified. It's all in my hand, it's in my whole physical structure, my eyes to my nose to my mouth. That ratio is found everywhere. The human body channels chi perfectly at the highest density 
over anything else in creation. Any, any animal, plant, you name it, the human body is designed to channel chi. And so these negative thought forms rooted in separation aren't built in divine structure. They're not built in the golden ratio, which means they do not self-reflect back to source, which means they cannot generate their own chi, which means they're now a finite system, which means they're capable of dying. And so this has been sort of plaguing our awareness for a long time and putting our perception into a box. And so when we speak about like AI, it's like you can say it's already here. It's been here. And a big shift with all these festivals and everything we're doing is learning to identify the parts of ourselves that really aren't ourselves and consciously choosing to let them go. Everything that instills conflict in our society is birthed outside of that. And so we're going through this rebirthing process right now. That's why I've been working on these tools, among many, many other things. And setting myself up to step into a new realm of technology. And so I worked a little bit on the Hyperloop project. Um, I might be getting back into that. There's all dynamics with a lot of mainstream tech and science I work with that I'm constantly navigating and very well connected to the crypto scene and things moving forth. And you can say that LA is sort of the front lines for many things happening right now, especially where uh, Hollywood is sort of the throat chakra of the planet. It influences our reality more than anywhere. And so there, there's so much afoot right now, so much changing before us. And I sort of put on hold my work with energy systems and, and other aspects. Actually, the technology I was working on last um, was a system that you could take any raw material, break it down with sound, down to the atomic level. It's an acoustic pulverizer, which also sounds a little dangerous. That's why you need to have like the right container in place to actually hold that technology. But what that is, is that's the embodiment of the alchemical process of purification. Because you can break it down to the atomic level to enjoy a pure element which means it has an intrinsic resonant frequency. It's not bonded to something else. So if you know the resonant frequency, you can vibrationally sort it into 100% purity, which is 100% pure gold. Because it also has that intrinsic resonant frequency, it means you're capable of developing a laser precision atomic 3D printer based on the vibrational resonance, resonances of the atoms you're using. And you can say, make this coil, which is played in 24 karat gold, actually entirely of 24 karat gold as a single metallic crystal. That's the game changer in technology, is, the, is when we get crystalline structures. You can hear about our bodies becoming crystalline. The crystalline structure then reflects the fractal in perfect divine order. And so with the end of this talk, I wanna pass around some of these pieces and talk about them a little bit more and show some really interesting things. So. Uh, I'm going to speak about the Ankh for a second. The Ankh has been a game changer for uh, my crew and the others who we've been sharing them with. And we, we do offer all these pieces, by the way. And the Ankh, I'm going to give a quick little download on how it works without going into all the history and so forth. Because this is way older than Egypt. Actually, Egypt is sort of irrelevant with this piece. And so the horizontal axis in the Ankh is the uh, linear masculine axis. It, it relates to linear resonance. And so it's tuned to the circumference of the earth. There's a lot more I could talk about that. I'm not gonna get super deep in the science and lose some people because we're getting into another realm of language there. But it tunes into the earth. And so it's feeding or uh, resonating this guy at a very small level. It's more working at passive state. But as it oscillates in resonance with the earth, in the horizontal, it then feeds the vertical axis, which is the feminine. It's the non-linear aspect. This is a big game change in our systems, is moving into non-linear systems. The coils I work with, work with non-linear magnetic fields. All of our current electrical systems work with linear magnetic fields. We will never generate the type of energy that we want to generate with linear systems. It's impossible. Non-linear is when we get exponential. And so, it starts to generate a very strong non-linear field in this system. And so then if you're wearing it, like I am here, these are in sterling silver, these ones, is what it does is your body's usually tuned to a linear resonance. That means that's the chi that's coming into you. And as you know, like 
you can only live so long without food and even less without water, even less without breath. And with chi, it's pretty much instantaneous. You cut your body off from chi, you're boom, body's dead. It's not receiving because uh, consciousness is not rooted in the body. It is an interface for consciousness. You could say if creation was a project, it's the whole project is to master embodiment of this interface, just sort of like the movie Avatar. And so this brings the physical vessel into a non-linear resonance, which means all the chi that's flowing through the environment at all times, at this festival space right now, it's a little bit higher density than everywhere else, mainly because the people here and the state of being everyone's in. Now, because I'm in a non-linear resonance, I'm coupling with more chi from the environment. Well, this brings some really interesting side effects into one's being. One, there's, you know, increased physical healing and so forth. The thing that's really the game changer is how it influences your awareness, your perception. In that a lot of people think their awareness is constant. It is constantly fluctuating all the time. And in some ways we all know this. You know, you change the music playing in the background, it changes your focus, say, being able to work on this, uh, this essay for school or so forth. And like, there's many of the Masonic colleges around this country that are built with specific forms of feng shui to facilitate our awareness to do specific things. And this is, this is really the science of feng shui. But these technologies are, you could say, this interesting fast track when you also know how to use it. There is also a active context of how this works. Bianca, you want to come up here for a second? This is my beautiful love from LA with me. Um, Hi guys. So, Bianca has here a tuning fork that's tuned to ohm. You can just demonstrate. And what she's doing is she's bringing this onk now into an active state because this vibration is the same vibration that's in the background of the earth, but at a much heightened amplitude. And so it's feeding that vibration into the onk. The onk is essentially a vibrational filter. It's taking a linear resonance and bringing it into a non-linear resonance. These two systems of vibration are very, very different. Linear is, is sort of where our society has also been. We've been a linear power structure. The way we power dynamics are moved around our system are linear. So just like in the pyramidal scheme, our hierarchies, we're moving into a spherical system of how the energy is distributed. That's a non-linear system. And so this is now bringing Bianca's body into a non-linear state. Well, she's already been, she's been rocking one. Um, and so you're coupling with more chi. There's more chi literally flowing into your body. There's also a place of where there's a, a surrender allowance to allow that chi in. It's not just like an end all be all, like here's a magic pill, you're gonna be a superhero now. There's still, there's still work involved. There's still a place of aligning your awareness to use these tools. And so, these are really simple tools to help with our spiritual evolution, but they aren't reliant. Because just as Bucky Fuller said, every tool is an extension of the self. And so, just like the heart ch chakra is your intrinsic part of your being, and this is the flow form of the heart ch chakra, this does not mean this will master your shark heart chakra. You need to master your own heart and open up your own heart. It's a training tool, it's a training wheel. So it can help bring your heart into alignment, it can help maintain your heart in alignment, but really the real work, you're the one doing it. And so, um, I'm gonna have Bianca walk around with uh, this onk, and so everyone can experience it. And then also at the end, we're gonna set up in the back, um, probably over there um, in that corner, um, with the tools, so if people don't have a chance, they can come experience them and also ask questions after. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so these coils, uh, the onks are, are new. The onks we've had since, uh, oh, we, we got them in actually on the full moon back in November, ironically. And we all had, we ended up having a ceremony that night with 25 people and everyone, this is when we discovered, well, what happens when you take a tuning fork to an onk? 25 people had mind-blowing experiences with this onk. Um, and especially if you're under the influence of certain 
uh, medicines, it definitely heightens your awareness with using such tools. But also, if you're very energetically sensitive, you're gonna pick up on it very quickly. And so, uh, I'm also gonna hand these coils around for people to experience. However, before that, I wanted to show you guys something really cool, and I'm trying to think, is this table good enough? I don't think it's, we have a perfectly flat surface. So I'm gonna show you guys some magic. And that's the thing about magic. Magic is really misunderstood. Magic is just science we don't understand yet. And it was a big part where we've been in this state of separation and our perception that it limited how we actually observe our reality and what is actually capable for us. Vibrational mechanics is a big key to all this. I think this guy will work. You want to like stand up and come on over here and so these coils um, work in a very unique way as in they're working right now and just like I showed we're showing you how the onks work in an active state there's also a passive state same with these coils when I'm laying them down on this table they're working in a passive state okay and when I told you how this represents this ratio of scaling between the outer ring to the inner ring the outer side to the inner side that ratio is the square root of two. This is the harmonic of two. So there's, it's a dynamic scaling of how these two interact. Now we have the world famous quartz crystal, which is like the staple of you know, the spiritual tools that everyone uses. And so place it here in the center. The thing is there's not much chi usually moving through a quartz crystal. You can't do much with it. You can do some things. You really have to turn them on. So what this guy does, is it takes the light that gets pulled into the vacuum that creates with these geometries, and I'm not gonna go into all the science behind it, um, and focalizes the chi. And, there's, and I, I sort of use chi and light interchangeably. I'm not gonna get fully into all that, so just bear with me. Um, focalizes it into this quartz crystal. It kicks up the bandwidth. So this is a really simplified percep perceptual computer. And how you can interface your awareness with ethereal aspects of consciousness. And so this is working in the passive state. Now I'm gonna show you the active state. Does someone have a flashlight on them, phone? You need a flashlight. It's so worth it. Here, can you shine the flashlight on for me? So you're just gonna go around the side when you're gonna see this. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spin this coil and we're gonna see something really cool. So there's a shadow in the center. It's a little light out here. My guys want to get close to see this. And so you can see a shadow in the center. And this is really simple physics. And if you actually can see the shadow up close, is the shadow has an asymmetry. This is a perfectly symmetrical coil. But this side is the exact same reflection on this side. The difference is, though, is when we spin this, the vortex you see inside of it has an asymmetry. If it was an optical illusion, it would be a symmetrical vortex, but there's asymmetry. And so what's happening here um, uh, is this is an electrical conductor. And so it's 3D printed in stainless steel bronze. It's a new, it's not that new, way directly printed in, in metal. And then it's played in silver. And so the Earth's magnetic field is flowing through the space at all times, flowing everywhere parallel to the surface of the Earth. When it flows through this coil, because it's a conductor spinning, it creates a changing electric field, thus a changing magnetic field, which creates an electromagnetic wave. What this torus does is it creates an oscillating spherical container. I mean by oscillating is it's not like a solid sphere, it, but it's, it's creating a sphere, but with a, uh, a phasing aspect. And so it lets light in or a magnetic field in at a point and then it blocks it. 
So it's sort of like cutting up the Earth's magnetic field. And then it funnels it inside the center of this torus and starts to circulate the light in a toroidal form. But it's creating extreme compression. And it's compressing all that light into the central vortex. And so what's being missed in physics with black holes is it's not actually black. If you were inside a black hole, it would be pure white light. It's extreme light compressed into the space in perfect parallel resonance. And then the vacuum is so high that any light that comes in the vicinity of it gets pulled into it and brought into that parallel resonance. And so you're seeing a shadow vortex because the vacuum is so intense and the light is in parallel resonance. It's circulating the light inside the system. And so if everyone wants to go back and take a seat, I'll bring this over there so we can take a close look at it after the talk. Um, what do we have for time? Yeah, four minutes. 110, I got five minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, so, then I'll, uh, how about I end this on the really fun piece of technology? Probably no one's expecting. So, for over a decade, no, it's been about a decade, I've made these copper wands and been really understanding how to work with a wand. And so, this is a real working wand. The really funny thing is being in the festival scene for all these years in the spiritual communities is people still look at me as sort of crazy with a wand. Yeah, there's this paramount aspect within our, within our love of fantasy that everyone loves this idea. Everyone loves the energy of a wizard. Yet there's a part where we still have a disconnect from our playful side. And the beautiful thing is there is like scientific truth in how this works. And so this has a quartz crystal in it. And quartz crystals are piezoelectric which means any sound that is played causes the crystal to vibrate and convert it into an electrical pulse. And there's a beautiful way in which the crystal structure is set up in a quartz of how it interacts with these three prongs going around it. Where normally how we set up our piezoelectrics is we have two directly opposing and we ignore the four other faces in the system. And so that's a linear setup where this is a polyphase setup. That was the paramount aspect that Tesla figured out. And so this coil, the Star of David, the Seal of Solomon, is Nikola Tesla's AC polyphase motor idealized. So the funny thing about you know, the Teslas on the road is that technology is currently 135 years old. It's been modernized quite a bit. I'm gonna take talks afterwards on the side. We only have a couple of minutes. And this is taking that system and idealizing it. It's bringing it into divine, perfected alignment. You can't get it better than this in terms of the geometry. That's where we're moving to science. We're actually perfecting the systems where we don't need rendition after rendition after rendition. We brought it to a state of perfection. And so with the wand, to end this talk on this, to like open our minds to a new direction of how we can explore is how this tool is an extension of myself and that my own hand is the wand and how I can command presence with my hand. I can command chi forth on the earth plane. However, the process to do that is not exactly what people think because it's a big piece of coming truly into alignment with yourself and how you go about moving with those subtleties. This just takes it up a whole nother level. And so I'd like to thank everyone for coming to this talk. I hope this opened the minds quite a bit um, in the directions in which we can go with science and technology. Um, if you're interested in following myself and my crew and what we've been creating, our company's called Alchemica, A-L-K-E-M-I-C-A. You can find us on Instagram, on the internet, it's alchemica.1, uh, O-N-E. Um, I'm making all of the uh, tools right now, plus other things as well. We've just been built out this space for the last six months. It's a design space by day, event space by night. As I said, we put 4,000 square feet of organite on it. It looks like a synthetic marble. Not only is it beautiful, but it feels amazing. So it's constantly clearing the energy out of the space all the time, keeping it fresh, not stagnant. Um, and it's an event space by night. And creating, you know, very uh, architected events 
to create very specific experiences to move forward our awareness in, in different directions. Seth, who's also been a fashion designer for the last 35 years in both New York and LA, makes this clothing. And so we have a whole clothing line. This uh, shirt is made out of Model cashmere and wool. Um, it breathes and it insulates at the same time. We have dresses. We just came out with our first line like two months ago. We got several colors. We're about to have a bunch more colors come in. We're also going into bamboo materials and hemp materials. And um, it's going to be, it's, it's, we're setting ourselves up to make a very extensive line of this clothing as well as other products. Um, we do a lot in event production and also ceremonial work. Um, and uh, uh, specifically around coaching. So we've been also like working with high level individual individuals who are very influential. Um, and so influencing the influencers to bring them into alignment of being like, hey, what if we create this? Do you feel this? And, and shifting that paradigm from a, you know, a, a place of deep alignment. And that's ultimately where I'm inviting you all into is coming into a deeper alignment with yourself because the reason that we're all here is to create, to design. And technology is a big piece of that. So the thing I love about technology is creating new tools, create new tools to create really fucking awesome things. And so why not do that every day? And we're literally at the point of that right now. So thank you everyone for coming and have a wonderful day.